reading the tea leaves now. Um, it seems at this point, at least as we were recording on Friday, May 17th at 9.14 a.m. Pacific, that J.J. Reddick is going to be, is at least a front runner at this point to be the coach of the Los Angeles Lakers, you know, at least in pole position at this point, right? And I wanted to have a conversation about the ramifications or just what, honestly, not even ramifications of his hire. We, we can get into that a little bit if he is hired, but more of just what this says about how we evaluate coaches and the coaching, you know, how coaches become candidates um, and things like that. And it's interesting, the rise of J.J. Redick. Um, you've seen it, um, Howard. We have talked about this um, in a different context, not necessarily for coaching, but just how he, um, what he means for just the current player analyst, um, you know, these days. But he has had a interesting trajectory into um to wanting to be a coach and getting into the coaching ranks that he had a, he had a, a interview last year. I think it was with the Charlotte Hornets. Um, and you know, he has dabbled and tipped it, dipped his toe into, um, coaching interviews and coaching cycles. Um, and we are in this space where we have hired, I mean, no, we, the NBA teams have hired coaches out of the broadcast booth. Um, Steve Kerr is a great example. Mark Jansen is a great example. Doc Rivers is a great example. But this seems this one seems a little bit different because at, at least in my view of it, it seems like at least we're seeing in real time a person, if it is the Lakers, a person that has angled for a job, at least the appearance of a person that is angled uh, for a job in real time in front of our eyes very publicly with the podcast that he has with LeBron, with the, uh, you know, his proximity to the Lakers in that way. And then if this happens, how that will manifest for a team that unlike uh, when Doc Rivers was hired, unlike when Mark Jackson was hired with the Warriors, and unlike when um, Steve Kerr was was hired, this seems to be a person that is not hired necessarily to grow this group, but to get this group to the next level uh, or get them to a title in a time where they have aging superstars. And it, I don't know what to make of this, but it seems different, Howard. When it this this courtship seems different than other courtships of guys that have been behind the booth. What have you seen from, you know, how this how this has come together? And if he is a Lakers coach, ends up being a Lakers coach, what does this mean for coaching carousels going forward? Yeah, I don't want to assume too much about whether he's the front runner. I mean, I know it seems like this is one of those situations where there's a lot of smoke, and so we're going to assume there's fire, and it, it may well end up that way in terms of like the way we got here like i don't know are you are we are we saying i guess are you saying implying that jj um there's a machiavellian element to this where he starts the show with lebron as as a means to like ingratiate himself and and put himself in the running because he knew he wanted to coach and he knew that's a place he potentially wanted to coach i mean is it that deliberate and direct or is it just I don't know. Are, are, like, I'm, I'm I think I think, think, I think there's the appearance of that. I don't know JJ, and I don't know his intentions, but I would say that there is the at least the appearance of that being the case for sure. Yeah, and and people will view it. I think some people will view it through that lens, and understandably, like it kind of looks that way through through. Um, it, it could look that way. I just think that if JJ never coaches the Lakers. Like the 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 pod with LeBron was going to happen regardless. Like whatever his whatever JJ's aspirations are. I mean, right now he's got you know his own burgeoning media empire. Right, he's got multiple successful podcasts and his broadcast career with ESPN uh, as as one of their lead color commentators. Like he's he's had a very rapid rise in the in the the media space. And 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 actually not that rapid. He started podcasting like seven eight years ago or whatever it was. Yeah, right. Yeah. He's really good at that. And so I think that anything he could do to further expand his broadcast slash podcast presence 
he was going to do. And the the pairing with LeBron was the most natural thing in the world. Two total basketball geeks who love explaining this stuff and breaking down plays and who are very good at it. And I think they've been really good together. Like it, it's so I think that I, I view that separately from this this whole sudden coaching candidacy with the Lakers, though I understand why people would would connect those two. I think it's this is not unprecedented. You just listed some of them. I was looking some of these up beforehand. I was going off mostly off the top of my head in the time that I've been covering the league. The number of guys who went straight to head coach with no bench experience, you named a few. Um, Danny Ainge in 96 was an assistant for all of eight games before Cotton Fitzsimmons retired and turned it over to Danny Ainge. And it didn't go great. Um, Ainge won he went 40 and 34 the rest of that way the, the first season, 56 and 26, and then 27 and 23 in the lockout season, um, and then 13 and Not 7 bad. before he resigned. It's fine, but they never won a playoff series. The records were good. They never won a playoff series. Uh, the next one was Larry Bird, Indiana, 1997, 58 wins the first year, uh, 33 wins in a lockout season with equivalent of like a 54-win season, then 56 wins and goes to the finals where the Pacers lost to the Lakers in 2000. Um, Doc Rivers, you mentioned straight from the broadcast booth to Orlando head coach in 99. He goes 41 and 41 that first season and wins coach of the year. They never get beyond 44 wins in his next three seasons. It's all like the low forties. Um, but they had zero talent when he took over. They had a, a pre Ben Wallace, Ben Wallace on that 99, 2000 team. And just a bunch of guys. They were cap. They were the first ever team, I think, to go. Let's clear the cap and chase superstars. That and then in, in 2000, that's when they signed Grant Hill and Tracy McGrady. They were trying to get Tim Duncan as well. And then Doc gets a few years of T Mac and a broken Grant Hill. Um, but they never won a playoff series. Uh, Isaiah Thomas, straight to head coach at Indiana after Larry Bird in 2000. 500 record the first year, 42 wins, 48, 38, 20, or excuse me, 33, 23. Took over a team with Reggie Miller and Jalen Rose, a young Jermaine O'Neal, a young Al Harrington, Jonathan Bender, who was supposed to be a stud, but uh, couldn't stay healthy. Uh, year two, run our test. Um, never won a playoff series. Mark Jackson in Golden State, 2011. We know what they did. Jason Kidd to the Nets in 2013, literally took off his Knicks jersey and was hired by the Nets the next day. That did not end great. <laughs> one year, one year, 44 wins, but it was a fake super team. It was the Darren Williams, Joe Johnson, Brooke Lopez, plus grafted on old Kevin Garnett and, and Paul Pierce. And they yeah, won 44 nice. games. Listen, they did uh, win a, an epic first round series against the Raptors. They lost to the Heatles in, in the second round, four to one. And then Kid bails out for Milwaukee, rocky, rocky few years there. Um, and Jason Kidd's looking pretty good in Dallas now, but it's his third different team. Um, Steve Kerr in 2014, we, we know the deal, comes in, wins four championships. He was terrible. Steve was terrible. <laughs> no idea what he was doing. Um, what, is he, what is he doing? Derek, Derek Fisher is the only other one of, of recent vintage. Um, and that was... Phil Jackson wanted to hire Steve Kerr, and when Steve wisely took the Warriors job instead, Phil Jackson turned to Derek Fisher, uh, who had just taken off his Oklahoma City Thunder jersey, um, 17 and 65 year one, 23 and 31 before he was fired the second season. So, um, yeah, he had, he had some off the court stuff that we don't have to talk about, but that was, no, uh, we, yeah, we, he, we it, was, it was a really toxic tenure from, uh, from yeah. uh, Derek Fisher. Not going um, any level. Um, no. But, I bring those all up, Logan, just to note that like there is it's a mixed bag when you go this route. I don't know that there's a right or wrong here in terms of skipping assistant coach experience. My my just general gut tells me that though there have been some really successful versions of this, that it's better to pay your dues as an assistant coach for a year or two at minimum first um, for all kinds of reasons. But um Listen, if 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 JJ Redick gets hired by the Lakers or somebody else, and immediately succeeds be, for all the reasons that you would expect him to, then then it means nothing for me to sit here and say, oh, you should have gone and been an assistant for fifteen years first. Like, right? It, it's you know you never know. But like there are other candidates that have been named so far: Chris Quinn, former player, uh, ten years as an assistant with the Heat; James Borrego, fifteen years as an assistant plus uh, four years as a head coach in Charlotte; Sam Cassell. 
15 years as a player, 16 years as an assistant. Mike Honori, 15 years as an assistant. David Adelman, 14 years as an assistant. You know, I, I tend to think that that experience matters, but all you have to do is is say, you know, Steve Kerr, Larry Bird, you know, you know, I mean, listen, even even Mark Jackson, like, like, okay, he didn't win titles, but like Mark Jackson got them from bad to good and put them in a place where Steve Kerr could get them to the next level um, with a different coaching style. But like the, you can find times when this worked and times it didn't. So I can't say definitively, like you have to be an assistant coach first. Why is it so alluring for guys that have been on television to get a leg up on guy because you just referenced Sam Cassell, who I believe, and I think you referenced some other guys who I believe are in the. Uh, I know Sam Cassell is in the coaching search for the Lakers, right? But yeah. you mentioned somebody like him who has paid his dues, and by all accounts, he did it the right way. He has the pedigree. He has been on the right staffs, um, and seems to be every time I've seen him around, seems to be loved by the players that he's coaching. Why are front offices? not more inclined, but are inclined to get a guy that they've seen on television more than they are inclined, or not more, but in these cases, more inclined to get a guy that has the assistant coach pedigree. Now, I think it's a little bit more even than we think it is, right? Like, there's been a lot of assistant coaches in recent years that have done well, that have gotten hired. Think about, like, Tyler Jenkins. He didn't didn't have any um, television experience, but you know, he was a really good assistant coach. He was somebody that has um, that has had success, right? There, there, you could go down the list of guys that have had success from assistant coaches. I mean, Darvin Ham is a guy that was just an assistant coach, and he was hired on to be a, a head coach. But what is the allure uh, from front offices to pick guys with no coaching experience out of the broadcast booth or out of the podcast room or out of the <laughs> podcast studio in this case? What is the allure of that? I don't want to say this too broadly because I'd have to go back and look at all these different instances and like who else was in the running and all that stuff. But I mean, listen, to an extent, especially when the owner's heavily involved, you know, owners don't really know basketball that well, but they do know names, right? They know, they know who Larry Bird is. They know who Doc Rivers is. They know who Isaiah Thomas is. They know who Mark Jackson is. Like all the guys who go from the booth, like they're all former players, right? So um, and a lot of the guys I just named, some of them are all-time greats. And there's a familiarity. Like, you may not – an owner doesn't actually know – they don't know the assistant coaches, especially the ones who have come up as lifetime assistants, who never – especially if they never played the game, right? And a lot of the guys I just named, right, who were on the Lakers list, like James Borrego, Mike Honori, David Adelman. I mean, Adelman, son of of, uh, of Rick Adelman, um, longtime head coach in the league. But, like, th- these guys are are – are not known to, to team owners. They should be known to GMs and team presidents, but, um, you know, Chris Quinn played in the league for a long time, but as a, you know, uh, you know, late bench player, right. Um, Sam Cassell obviously had a very good career. I think familiarity matters sometimes if owners don't know the pedigree of an assistant coach, but, Oh, I know who Sam Cassell is. I watched that guy win a couple championships with the Rockets or like, Oh, I know who, you know, Steve Kerr is. I saw him winning championships with Michael Jordan and and Tim Duncan. I think it's that. Like, I think there's a level of celebrity involved here. And that's not to diminish the acumen of any of the folks we're talking about. But I'm saying if if you're looking at this through the eyes of a team owner who doesn't necessarily know basketball people and are not mingling with assistant coaches on a regular basis, but they know who Jason Kidd is, right? Yeah. Um, And so there's some of that. So the, the broadcast part of it, it puts them in a position where you you hear how they analyze the game. You get familiar with their personality. Uh, most guys get on TV because they're they're they've got the personality for it, which means they're engaging. I mean, Doc Rivers, one of the most engaging personalities in the history of the game, whether as player, coach, or broadcaster. And I I think that helps pave the way. You know, yeah. As I mean, there's to, like, also this whole ecosystem that I don't think we talk about. Like, I think Doc Rivers is a great example of this. Of guys, I mean, we both know Doc, and we have both been around Doc. Great at smoozing, an all-time oh, yeah. smoozer, just all time, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so, like, especially to like, you could be a. It's one thing to be a smoozer to like potential front office people, but there's another element to this of like guys that are smoozers to the media and. On the back end, those media folks might help 
how they'll maybe be more inclined to be like, oh, Doc Rivers is a good guy. I liked how he, you know, he held me down that one time when I needed a quote. Um, I might write something glowing of how good he could be. And I'm just, just one example, right? But like that's that's something that that happens as well, right? Somebody that can work a room and the broadcasters have a unique uh space in this to where like I'll take Steve Kerr as an example. Like if he's in the broadcast booth, he can both talk to simultaneously talk to potential ownership group and talk to us in the media, right? Yes. Like just and, and uh parlay that into either good coverage or something. He can he can politic in a way that maybe a Sam Cassell can't because he's locked in on a post on a playoff series and you know like they Teams don't necessarily like their assistant coaches talking to the media during the postseason or when it's this time, right? Like it's, the, the, I feel like broadcasters have a bit more of an inside track than a assistant coach. Is that, is that off base? Or at least they have. That's an advantage that people in the broadcast booth have is that they do have proximity to both the media who can help them and also uh, the front office who they can talk to in a way that assistants can't. Maybe, but I don't think that we have that great of an influence on who gets hired ultimately. Um, yeah. it, it may help their portrayal. Uh, we may be writing more positively about them in general, sure. Like, But I, I, I think it's more the fact that the same effect that it has on media, like, oh, I hear this guy on TV every night. He seems really smart about the game. He's very thoughtful. He's engaging, whatever. And yes, when I've talked to him, I get all those things too. It's just the same effect on the owners. The owners are hearing and seeing the same things that we are in the yeah. media. And so if a guy seems engaging and sharp and quick on their feet and all that stuff it, it you know it it comes off well and listen like coaching is about a dozen or two dozen or several dozen different things in terms of what makes you successful or not and your personality matters now i've i've yeah. dealt with many coaches who have dud personalities who have still been successful i don't need to uh list them here um but I do think you can that, list them on the paywalled version of real ones, like okay, <laughs> after when all the records I, are done. I I I do think that being a coach who has an engaging personality, or you know, it's quick witted, fun to talk to, fun to listen to. If it's fun, if if those folks are engaging to us as media or as fans listening on TV, then then they are probably in the room with the owner and probably in the, in the locker room too. And I do think that that actually, it doesn't always work. Great personality, shitty tactics. You're still going to lose games. Right. But to the extent that coaching and success is about buy-in as we always talk about, uh, you know, it kind of helps to have a good personality that, that brings guys along with you. And so if you're on TV, if you've got a great broadcasting career, it's probably because you've got some of those uh, attributes in the first place. Let's put a bow on this really quickly. Um, at least put it from the Lakers' point of view. How much of like JJ being the front runner has to do with like this? Isn't really in a like I know on paper it might be an attractive job. You, I get to I get to coach LeBron and AD, but it's not really that attractive of a job when you peel back the layers. Like Byron no. Winors discussed it. Um, first of all. The Lakers don't pay coaches, which isn't like great. Um, and they've lost out on good coaches because they don't want to pay them. And you also have to deal with the it's it's one thing to deal with the Lakers spotlight, but then you add LeBron and the pressure that he just puts on a coach um just by sheer presence and then also just like, you know, it's just really tough being LeBron James's coach. And then you're in that media market in LA. How much of it is JJ being, you know, propped up in this way because of just the circumstances of how unattractive that job is right now. And this might be his chance or or most coaches that are good, like Coach Bud instantly went to Phoenix. He wanted to go to Phoenix before like L.A. was even an option, right? Like how much of that is a – how much of – JJ's candidacy has to do with where we are uh, with the Lakers coaching search and where they are as a team and an organization right now. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different stuff there. I, I, so first, I would just say this, like the I named the assistant coaches who have been um, reported to be in the running. Those are all like long term assistants who have more than earned a shot, who I think are, are all really strong candidates. 
who clearly are interested, right? So like it, there's only, you know, it's the old cliche, there's only 30 of these jobs. Is it that great of a job long-term given some of the, the you know, fundamentals of that roster? No, like that this, this team is going to crash and burn sometime soon um, whenever LeBron hangs it up or whenever LeBron finally loses a couple of steps. And then it's, you know, a, a mid-career Anthony Davis. And is he in, can you build around an Anthony, a uh, contender around Anthony Davis? I would say that the evidence suggests no. Um, and also one other thing, Howard, I don't believe like I, I heard I, I heard something written out there. I think it, was, it might have been Shams that that if, if JJ or any coach gets this, they want the, the Lakers want a coach that can both coach LeBron through his last years and then coach a team led by Anthony Davis. And I'm like, that's not even realistic. If when if and when LeBron James retires, that coach is not lasting after that. It's not going to happen. Like, no, it, it's um, not. No, you're you're in a rebuild after that. Some sort of rebuild. Yeah. Um, maybe you're a little bit ahead of the game because you have Anthony Davis, but you still you need another leading star because Anthony Davis is not a number one. And you know, plus you know, look, uh, we don't need to go chapter and verse through all the other stuff that's going on with that organization the last several years. But like, I don't have all that much confidence in them to to rebuild a contender once LeBron's gone. They, you know, if not for LeBron choosing the Lakers. Just because he wanted to be in L.A. and because the Lakers have the legacy they do, then, then they're not even relevant right now. And Anthony Davis chose them because of LeBron. Like, what what have they what have they shown us that proves they can build a contender? Nothing. So I, I I don't yeah. So I don't have a lot of confidence in them beyond whatever the LeBron era ends up being. Um, that's why they want to give LeBron whatever he wants. Forget what you heard and the leverage and all these things is because they don't have any other options beyond that. No. So, yeah, I mean, listen, it's always going to be an attractive job because it's L.A. and because it's the Lakers and because it's one of 30. Is it an attractive job because you can be confident that that they're going to give you the tools you need as a coach and the roster you need? I, I have my doubts once LeBron retires. But it'll be interesting to see, like, does is this J.J.'s job to lose? Does he take it? Does he, you know, would he pass on this and say, you know what? For all the reasons you and I just discussed, maybe he decides, I, I do want to be a head coach, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for a different kind of opportunity. Maybe he wants to coach a younger team, or maybe he wants to coach a team that's like I, on the rise and getting ready to break through more of kind of like, like you know, when the Warriors hired Steve Kerr, that kind of situation yeah. where it's, you know, mid, mid-tier team um, with, with some lifespan ahead of it, as opposed to a team that's already on on the downswing. I just see the the Lakers coaching uh, opening is such a black hole for JJ. I don't really want him to be, not even for the the reasons like, I mean, there's always the reasons that we we pointed out, but I, I just feel like if he really wants to be a coach and, a, and it's something that he's serious about, like this is probably a two-year gig and you might not get an op after this, right? Because of all the things that we have described, right? Like you have the spotlight. Um, you, It's hard for a young coach, especially a first-time coach to grow in that type of environment where Every day it is something. And then you put the LeBron element on top of that. Um, the scrutiny involved, every one of your moves, every one of your mistakes is magnified all that much more in a market like that. I don't know if that is the, the, the it sounds good, but it's just like LA. It's great until you get there. Sorry. Uh, a couple of, a couple of other things. My though. bad. No, but dude, <laughs> <laughs> spoken like a true Bay Area native. Um, I, I would just say this too, though. LeBron and JJ right now, on some level, I, I I don't I don't know enough to define this, but on some level, they're friends, right? Like they're peers. They host a podcast together. They're 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 clinking wine glasses. They're like having a good time. And then then and and I I get it. Like you can navigate both personal relationship and coach to player relationship. It's possible to do. Plenty of folks have done it. But like to have no to have no coaching experience and to go in with that relationship and now have to be like, okay, but now I'm the guy in charge. And when LeBron yeah. says, get this guy out of the rotation, or I don't want to start with this guy or whatever. And JJ, you have spend to so much that. time courting him to do a podcast with you. It's just, it's just a, it changes the it's relationship. Weird. Listen, you, this has happened over the course of years too, with assistant coaches, assistant coaches can have more of a friendship with players and be the guy who, who yeah. goes to him and says, yeah, man, you're getting screwed. I'm, I'm, I'm advocating for you, whatever. And then the, the guy gets fired. You become the head coach and your relationship to your players immediately changes. I've seen that too. And so JJ is going to have to change, you know, have to navigate this, the shift in relationship. Plus he wasn't a player that long ago. 
And so whether it was Jason Kidd or Derek Fisher or any of these guys, if you, it's one thing like Doc had been in the broadcast booth for a while. Steve Kerr had been in the broadcast booth for a while. Mark Jackson had for a while. When you go almost straight from, and I know JJ has been retired a couple of years now, but when you go and you're now coaching guys who you played against, they may have certain impressions of you or thoughts about you as a rival player. Are and you that saying might- that NBA players are petty and childish? <laughs> okay, I don't believe that. <laughs> I'm just saying, J- JJ has has made uh, you know JJ's had a certain you know uh, uh, you know made a certain reputation on, on other players. Yeah, he's got a reputation. Hey, it's the Duke yeah. thing. A lot of it's the Duke thing. Some of it's a JJ thing. Um, yeah, but I don't know. That's I, another not- thing that I'm like curious about. Like, yo, man, do you want to go in during this time? Because I don't know how many people are gonna like and like he's JJ is just divisive by nature. Like, yeah, yeah, and Dude, I'm not even saying as a like, broadcaster. Yeah. Even, Even as, as a, broadcaster. a broadcaster, like, do you, nothing shows you who you are like television. And like, that's just what it is. It just magnifies that. And I think that right now, I don't know if that's going to be conducive to this type of locker room. But anyways, we'll see what happens. Um, we'll talk more in depth about this. If or when he gets hired, we'll see. Who knows? Who knows?